to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim the news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The word of God says, But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, that prophet shall die. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 20. We welcome you today to our study of the religion of Islam. Today in particular, we're going to be asking the question, was Muhammad a prophet of God or was he a religious imposter? Can we look at the evidence and can we know one way or the other? Friend, there is ample evidence to show that Muhammad was not a prophet of God, that he was indeed a religious imposter. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. We hope that you'll have your Bible handy as well as we're going to consider things from the Word of God that go along with this also. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, we're making those available to you free of charge. You can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com, fill out a free media request form, and we'll mail those to you free of charge as well. If you've got a question or you'd like to study the Word of God more, please call us or write to us or email us from the website. We'd love to help you in any way in your study of the Word of God. Why do we need to consider whether Muhammad was a prophet or not? What does that really have to do with the religion of Islam? Friend, you cannot, you cannot take a critical look at Islam without first considering Muhammad's life and whether he was a prophet of God. For the story of Islam is directly connected to Muhammad. Allegedly, Muhammad received revelations from God, giving him the Quran, and he wrote those down. Therefore, I need to know for sure whether he is from God, a prophet from God, or whether he has put a massive hoax on lots of people today. Now, the song of Muhammad's life by every Muslim, Muslim is composed in musical notes made of pure gold around the world. Islam's favorite son, was he really a prophet from God? Or is he just a religious imposter like others that we've seen throughout time? In this study, we're going to take a look at, at all the evidence from Muhammad's life to see if he was a prophet. And while there may be some good things that Muhammad did, there are also many documented things that are against the teachings of the Quran and the oral tradition that Muslims hold and esteem very, very highly. Now, what evidence are we going to give today? I want to cite our sources so you'll know that the things we're saying, even Muslims would realize these are good sources. The first source, of course, will be the Quran. The Quran to the Muslim is their Bible. And so we're going to quote from the Quran and show these things as well. We'll also quote from the Sahih Bakura and the Sahih Muslim, and these are considered the most authentic hadiths. A hadith is oral tradition that is held very highly by every Muslim and would only be second to the Quran itself. Ibn Said was a Sunni Muslim scholar. We'll note many things he wrote down, which also Muslims will accept. And also the Surat Rasul Allah is the earliest and most authentic biography of Muhammad's life. We will document many things from that, as well as one of their imams, Al-Bakura, and his collection of various hadiths, and Al-Tabari, which is a prominent and influential scholar, historian, exegete of the Quran. And so we're not going to go to Christian or Jewish sources. We want to go directly to Muslim sources to see if Muhammad's life is really what it should have been and if he really was a prophet of God. All right, we remind you again. And incidentally, the Muslims believe in the Torah. That would be Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So they believe the first five books of the Old Testament def definitively are from God. That being the case, 
Here's what the fifth book of the Torah says. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, that prophet shall die and God will go on to say, you don't have to worry about his words. Well, if the Torah, if Deuteronomy says that, then friend, what, does, what do we know about Muhammad and his life that will help us in this study? Here's what Muhammad from Al-Tabari, who was one of the great exegetes, historian, looked up to and esteemed highly uh, about Muhammad's life. Here's what Al-Tabari said. He said that Muhammad recorded these words. I have fabricated, Muhammad said at one point, I have fabricated things against God and have imputed to him words which he has not spoken. Recorded in the history by one of their great scholars that at one time Muhammad claimed to make stuff up on behalf of God. Well, what in the world is he talking about? Well, here's the actual story of that. Muhammad at one time actually spoke in the name of false gods. Therefore, Muhammad would not be a true prophet of Allah because at least in one point he represented and spoke on behalf of a false god. Now, these are known by many as the satanic verses that were at one time included in the Quran. Here's what we know about them. We learn about these satanic verses not from Christian or, or Jewish sources, but from very early Muslim writings. Accounts of the satanic verses that were originally in the Quran are given in a number of early sources. Ibn Ishaq, Waqidi, Ibn Sa'd, Al-Tabari, uh, just a various host of early Muslim scholars attribute to the fact that yes, these things are true. Moreover, the Sahih al-Bakura, Islam's most trusted source on the life of Muhammad, gives indirect confirmation of this event. Beyond this, certain verses in the Quran actually reveal a response Muhammad had to an embarrassing lapse he made back into polytheism. And so you've got their sources, you've got history, and you've got confirmation from the Quran as well. All right, let's talk about these satanic verses. Here's the story. It is recorded these words. When the messenger of God saw how his tribe turned back on him and was grieved to see them shunning the message he brought to them from God. He longed in his soul that something would come to him from God which would reconcile him with his tribe. With his love for his tribe and his eagerness for their welfare, it would have delighted him if some of the difficulties which they made for him could have been smoothed out and he debated within himself and fervently desired such an outcome. And then he said these words, Have you thought about Allah and al and Manat, the third and the other? Satan cast on his tongue because of their inner debates and what he desired to bring his people these words. These are the high-flying cranes. Verily, their intercession is accepted with approval. Now, I know all that may be a little confusing, but let me give you the back story of this. Muhammad is uh, from a tribe of pagans, basically, polytheists who believe that there are different gods and he's trying to bring them back in his mind to Allah. And so they have various gods. They've got the flying cranes, they've got birds, they've got other things that they view as gods. And so Muhammad is trying to teach these people in his mind the words of Allah that there is but one true God and they're not taken to it. In fact, there's fights, there's struggles, there's debates. People in his own family don't want to have anything to do with it. And so he's got this inner struggle going on. And so he says, let me tell you about your gods, Allah, Allah, and Manat. These are the high-flying cranes. You can pray to them. What? How could he teach that? Well, here's the story behind it. These polytheists were delighted that Muhammad had at last approved of their gods. To return the kindness, they prostrated themselves because of the reference to their gods, which they had heard, so that there was no one in the mosque, believer or unbeliever, who did not prostrate himself. And so this kind of worked for Muhammad. When he said, you could pray to your gods, they said, man, we like you a lot better now, and they bowed down before him. Now, Muhammad's friendly relations with these polytheists, though, polytheists were short-lived. For he soon learned that his verse, these verses praising these pagan idols, listen now, came not from God, but from Satan. 
saddened to recognize the treachery against Allah, Muhammad lamented these words, I have imputed to God words which he had not spoken. Yet, the history records, Gabriel comforted Muhammad, informing him that all prophets fall for Satan's tricks from time to time. Now, you say, okay, that's all good, that's history, that's oral tradition, that's from all these hadiths, but is there any confirmation of that in the Quran, the Bible of Islam? Well, friend, there actually is. The Quran says in chapter 22, verse 52, these words, and we did not send before you any apostle or prophet, but when he desired, that is, Satan made a suggestion respecting his desire, when Muhammad desired it, and Satan made that suggestion because Muhammad already wanted it. But Allah annuls that which Satan cast, then does Allah establish his communications, and Allah is knowing and wise. And so the Quran confirms this event. The Quran confirms that what history recorded, what the Hadith record, what Al-Tabari records, that it's actually true. And it goes on to say, we didn't send Satan. God didn't send him, but because Muhammad wanted that, Satan found an entrance in, and Satan actually spoke through Muhammad at least on one occasion. Now friend, listen carefully. Here's the conclusions that you have to draw, the conclusions that are naturally inferred from this. It is clear from the Quran, the Hadiths, and oral tradition that the Prophet of Islam on at least one occasion delivered a message that did not come from God. It is also clear that Muhammad on at least one occasion spoke on behalf of Satan and in the name of false gods. Now friend, here's what the scriptures teach. The book of Deuteronomy, the scriptures teach that a prophet who speaks something presumptuously, that's exactly what Muhammad did, is not God's prophet. Presumptuously means failing to observe the limits or, or what is limited or permitted or appropriate. Muhammad definitely did not do that. And so Muhammad spoke on behalf of false gods. He spoke presumptuously. Therefore, the Torah, the book of Deuteronomy, clearly teaches us Muhammad is not a prophet of God. Now, here's the, here's the question you've got to consider. Uh, think about this with me. Scriptures teach that a prophet who speaks something presumptuously is not God's prophet. Muhammad, at one time, was inspired by Satan, therefore he is not God's prophet. Now, the question rises, is, is raised. If Muhammad, and it's confirmed by their history, confirmed by the Quran, if Muhammad on at least one occasion was inspired to give a message of polytheism by Satan, how can I ever trust? anything else he said? How can I know that anything Muhammad said is actually from Allah? I'm always going to be left wondering, was this also a message from Satan? How do I know that in chapter 2 of the Quran, Satan wasn't inspiring him here? How do we know that when he said these things, that it wasn't Satan instead of God? Friend, all credibility and trust is lost in Muhammad as a prophet if at least on one occasion he was inspired to give a message by Satan. And the Quran confirms that he actually was and that God had to go back and correct it. And so Muhammad, he's not a prophet of God. Muhammad is a false prophet. Jesus Christ warned us of these kind of teachers when he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. What's Muhammad? He's not a prophet of God. He at one time was a prophet of Satan, and he is not. You cannot trust his credibility, and you cannot trust what he says. Now, let's talk then for just a few moments about some of the inconsistencies and, and contradictions in the Quran. Now, remember, God's prophets don't make mistakes. They speak on behalf of God when they are being inspired the message of God. When they are revealing God's Word, that message is true. Deuteronomy 18 verses 20 through 22 again teaches this idea. Let's see if Muhammad meets this test 
set forth by God in the law. Here's what the Quran says, allegedly Muhammad said on behalf of Allah concerning violence. Chapter 5 verse 28 of the Quran, even if you stretch out, Muhammad said, even if you stretch out your hand against me to kill me, I shall not stretch out my hand against you to kill you, for I fear Allah, the Lord of the world. So that sounds pretty good. Even if you try to kill me, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to create violence. I fear God. That's the right thing to do. But then, a little later, we find Allah's messenger said, Who is willing to kill? Kabin al-Sharaf, who has hurt Allah and his apostles. Therefore, Maslama got up saying, O Allah's messenger, would you like that I kill him? The prophet said, Yes. Maslama said, Then allow me to say a false thing to deceive Kaab. The prophet said, You may say it. Now, where does that come from? Three Islamic sources cite this for us. The Basaha Bakuri, the Surat Rasala and Ibn Sa'ad. And all of these are recognized as trustworthy, as honorable, and as representing truth. And so in the Quran, Muhammad said this. It's recorded by multiple sources in his life that he did not do that. What about the number of wives that Muhammad was to have from the Quran? Well, here's what the Quran says in chapter 4, verse 3. If you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with the orphans, Marry women of your choice, two or three or four. But if you fear you shall not be able to deal justly with them, then only one or a captive that your right hand possesses, that will be more suitable to prevent you from doing injustice. And so basically, allegedly, Allah said to Muhammad, you can marry two or three or four wives. If you don't think you can deal right with all of them, marry one or a captive. And so no more, maximum, four wives, but probably not even wives at that point. Well, how many wives did Muhammad have? Muhammad had 11 wives, 11 different wives throughout his lifetime. Uh, he, on this subject, he and every, the multiple histories of Islam, the, the Hadith, the oral traditions, the history of his life, multiple. In fact, every source will cite that he had 11, 10 or 11 wives at least. And so God said maximum four. He had 11. What does that tell us about Muhammad's character in following the Quran? The two don't add up. He didn't live what he taught. That doesn't make him then a prophet in the sense that he was honorable, trustworthy, and someone that men should follow today. Muhammad actually had different ideas when it related to the drinking of alcohol. Here's what the Quran says in chapter 2, verse 219. They ask you concerning wine and gambling. Say, in them is great sin and some profit for men, but the sin is greater than the profit. Now, when his position was strongly established later on in his career, he forbade the use of intoxicants entirely. Chapter 5, verse 93. O oh, you who believe, intoxicants and gambling, dedication of stones, divination by arrows are an abomination of Satan's handiwork. Askew them. And so when you look at an earlier writing, and then one that came a little later when he's more established. At one point he said, it's not good, but maybe a little. Later he said, it's of Satan, don't do it at all. When you think about these things, we again see some inconsistencies and contradictions that occur. Now, when you think about Muhammad, one of the things that really stands out about Muhammad, and one of the reasons that I think it's really hard, it'd be really hard to follow him, is this. The entire faith of Islam, it really rests upon defending Muhammad as a prophet of God, who it is very hard to defend. Wafa Sultan, an ex-Muslim Syrian doctor and psychiatrist said this. He said, it is impossible that a man who did the things Muhammad did could be a prophet of God. That's one who used to be a Muslim. He's a Syrian doctor and psychiatrist. He said, it's almost impossible to defend Muhammad. It's impossible that a man in his mid-50s could do some of the things Muhammad did with one of the women that he married. Did you know that when Muhammad was 50 years old, he actually married and actually consummated his marriage 
to a nine-year-old girl? I want you to think about these recorded histories. Here's what we have recorded for us. The prophet engaged me when I was a girl of six years. We went to Medina and stayed at the home of Bani Al-Harith bin Khazar. Then I got ill and my hair fell down. Later on, my hair grew again. And my mother, Um Rahman, came to me while I was playing in a swing with some of my girlfriends. She called me and I went to her not knowing what she wanted me to do. She caught me by the hand and made me stand at the door of the house. I was breathless then and when my breathing became all right, she took some water, rubbed my face and head with it. Then she took me into the house. There in the house I saw some Ansari women, these are uh, holy women, who said best wishes and Allah's blessings and good luck. Then she entrusted me to them, and they prepared me for the marriage. Unexpectedly, Allah's apostle came to me in the forenoon, and my mother handed me over to him. At that time, I was a girl of nine years of age. Now, this is found in Sahi Al-Bakuri, Volume 5, Book 58, Number 234. Again, a trusted Islamic source records the fact that Muhammad, who at the age of 50, actually married a nine-year-old girl. Not only did he marry her, but he also consummated that marriage to her. Khadijah, that was one of his first wives, died three years before the prophet uh, departed to Medina. He stayed there for two years or so and then married Aisha. This is the girl who is nine years old when she was a girl of six years of age and she consumed and he consumed that marriage when she was nine years old and so actually married her at six, consummated it at nine years of age. Now Sahih al later, later records this, that the prophet married Aisha when she was six years old and consummated his marriage when she was nine years old and that she remained for him nine years, they say is actual proof. Aisha reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old. He was taken, she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine. Her dolls were with her and when he died she was 18 years old. Again, this comes from Sahih Muslim chapter 8 verse 33 11. Now, I want you to think about this. Here's what you think about Muhammad having 11 wives, Aisha, one of the last ones, actually marrying her at six or seven, consummating, having sexual relations with her at the age of nine. I want you to think about that. Let that sink in for a moment. And then I want you to think about what the Quran says about Muhammad in chapter 33, verse 21. Here's what the Quran says about Muhammad. Surely in the messenger of God, talking about Muhammad, you have a good example. Friend, could I ask you this? Does a 50-year-old man marrying a six or seven-year-old girl and consummating that marriage, having sex with her at nine years old, sound like the kind of example you would want to follow? Not at all. It's impossible that a man could do those type of things and someone look at him and say, that's who I want you to follow. That's who I want to follow. In fact, friend, I want you to think about this. If a 50-year-old man today, if we found a 50-year-old man who had married a six-year-old girl, or we found a 50-year-old man who had sex with a nine-year-old, would we call him a prophet today? No, we've got another word for it. He would be a pedophile. Muhammad was not a prophet of God. He violated the teaching of marriage in the Quran. And friend, this is not a good example to follow. Muhammad, according to our standards, would be looked at as a pedophile and no one can defend. These, are, these things are recorded in their own histories. These are not things Christians or Jews are making up. This is Muslim history. How could someone at 50 years of age have sex with a nine-year-old girl and anybody walk away and say, that's a prophet of God, I want to follow him. And you just can't walk away and think those kind of things. But not only was Muhammad a pedophile, Muhammad was also an adulterer. Now here's what the Quran says. In chapter 4, verse number 23, the Quran says, Forbidden to you are your mothers and your daughters and your sisters, your paternal aunts, your paternal mothers and aunts, brothers. He goes on to tell, no adultery. Don't be marrying other women. The wives of your sons, you're not to marry. When actually, Muhammad did marry one of his son's wives later on. 
Now, why say all these things? Are we trying to just make Muhammad out to be a bad guy? Friend, not just for the sake of uh, because we don't like him, but there's a, there's a standard. There's a test. And we want you to see as we've laid out the evidence today, at one time he was inspired by Satan. He did not follow the Quran and its teaching on, on how many wives he was to have. He didn't follow the Quran on marriage. He later went back and changed it. He had sex with a nine-year-old girl. He would lie. He would fornicate. He would murder. He'd be involved in adultery. Why say all that? Friend, we want the evidence about Muhammad to come to the forefront for this reason. People need to realize, people, billions of people around the world need to realize that the, the son of Islam, the originator and founder of Islam, was not a good person. That he did many things that are contrary to what most people believe is good and moral and right, and that his own life contradicts the alleged words he received from God. And so when you examine the evidence, their evidence, you can see his life doesn't add up. What does all that mean? Friend, Muhammad was not a prophet of God. He was not sent by Allah. The angel Gabriel did not give him revelations. And the Quran is not from God. These things are not true. They're not right. Good common sense can help us to see this is not the way that it ought to be. And so when I look at all the evidence, Islam, the Quran, Muhammad, they're not the religion of God. The Bible still stands the test of time. God's prophets, when they re received the message of God, they spoke on behalf of God and, and they lived up to the life that God wanted them to live in the Scripture. That's not to say man isn't sinless, but you know when we claim somebody's a prophet of God and his messages are from God, we need to show that and back that by the evidence. And so today we hope you to continue to study with us as we're going to think in the next couple of lessons more about the Quran and about the Islamic view of Jesus Christ. And as always, we want to bring Jesus to the forefront, to point people to Him because He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Jesus Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.